Okay, I'm going to be preaching on Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. I think there's some good themes in here. Um, and uh, most Christians would be familiar with the second part of Ephesians 5, which is a very famous passage about the roles within a marriage, but uh, less familiar with the first half of Ephesians 5. So I think when you see the whole chapter in context, it'll make sense, I think, why he addresses marriage in the second part of Ephesians 5. So... As we read through that chapter, and hopefully as you read, you know, and Alex is reading, you're thinking about what the words are saying, you'll see, and you may not have noticed, but the the theme of the chapter of Ephesians 5 is about how to live wisely in this world as a child of God, right? So this is why it starts off, um, and I'll I'll break up the chapter into three sections. So the first section of this chapter is is being a child of God. So it starts off in Ephesians 5.1, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. So for a a couple of things here. So you remember in Ephesians chapter 4, it's really talking about our relationship with each other, unity in the church. Now this one is a bit more like your own walk with God. Right, So I see that when I look at the sins in here, they're more like sins that are personal to us as opposed to sins that affect other people, even though you know, sins in our life obviously affect other people as well. But I'm saying indirectly rather than uh, directly. But <clears throat> we see here, be therefore followers of God as dear children. So 1 John 3 tells us here, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So what what 1 John is talking about here is, if you understand what happens at salvation, and when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, remember we're three parts, body, soul, and spirit. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our spirit's born again. So we are not yet fully sons of God because we still have the same flesh. Our flesh is not a son of God. Um, I would say the Bible actually describes our flesh as a child of the devil. That's why why we sin. That's that dichotomy we see in 1 John 3. But the blessing that we have (coughs) and what 1 John 3 is referring to here is that even though we are not fully sons of God, we only have the earnest of the inheritance. We're born again in the Spirit. So we are like half son of God if you you think of it that way we are still treated and considered as sons of God even though we have not yet fully become sons of God both in in body soul and spirit that's why in verse 2 it says beloved now are we the sons of God so we even though God treats us as it's a blessing right it's a blessing that you know even though our the process of becoming a son of God is not fully complete both body and spirit We are treated as sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So it's talking about the resurrection, right? But we know that when he shall appear, this is when Jesus returns, the rapture, we shall be like him. So both in body and in spirit. But we shall see him as he is. Because obviously we don't (coughs) get to see him now. The apostles did and some of the early disciples. But many Christians throughout all history did not see Jesus Christ in his glorified body. So when we look at Ephesians, be therefore followers of God as dear children, he's reminding the Ephesians, you know, you're a child of God, so walk as one. Live as a child of God. You know, don't live like the old man. Put on the new man, you're a child of God. Live as a child of God. You know, walk wisely in this world as a child of God. Obviously, Jesus Christ being our perfect example of love. We talked about in Ephesians chapter 3, the love that passeth knowledge because it's the love he had even for his enemies. And this is why he's saying you walk as a child of God, God by walking in love, Christ being that perfect example. He'd given himself for us, you know, who are enemies of God, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Now this is a reference here to Jesus Christ going to hell for our sins. Right? Because what is the sweet-smelling savour? The sweet-smelling savour is the burnt sacrifice in the Old Testament. Right? Exodus 29, this is, the, this is talking about the morning and evening sacrifice of the lamb. But <coughs> Exodus 29, 41. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at even. 
and shall do there to according to the meat offering of the morning and according to the drink offering now for a sweet savour, look at this, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So we see there a reference in Ephesians 2 of Jesus Christ going to hell because his soul was made an offering for sin, right? In Acts 2 says his soul was not left in hell. And here he's saying he has given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. What? How do you get the sweet-smelling savour if the lamb was just killed? Right? So the sweet-smelling savour is because the lamb, the morning and evening savour, is killed as a burnt offering. And sometimes you think of these burnt offerings, what would the smell be like? Well, think about a barbecue, right? That's why there's, there's the sweet-smelling savour. It's like these, these animals are getting sacrificed in fire and it actually smells very good, the, the smell of the meat being cooked. Right? So that's why it's a sweet smelling savour. And sometimes, you know, when you, when you put it fresh, you know, it reminds me of camping. You can realise I'm, I'm hungry right now, I'm looking forward to lunch. So, you know, when you go camping, and you, I don't know if you ever put that, like that steak on the, on the really hot coals, and you can smell the, the sweetness, right? The, sort of the sugars in the meat. So that's, why, that's, that's what I think about when I think of sweet smelling savour. So Jesus Christ, obviously being our perfect example, how we should walk in this world. So he goes on, there's some other practical advice here. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. So remember the, the practical advice about unity in Ephesians 4, is like how you relate to other people. Don't lie to each other, don't steal, you know, you know resolving conflict. Whereas here I feel that what he's addressing here is more like, your per, like personal sins. You know, fornication. I mean, obviously you've got to sin with somebody else, but you know, the lusts of the flesh. Uncleanness here... Is talking about your body cleanness. And I think specifically what he's alluding to in this chapter is drug use, substance abuse. And that's why, you know, when we look later on in Ephesians 5, it says, be not drunk with wine. I think this is all, they, they all, the whole chapter relates back to these like four categories of sins, right? So you have the sexual sins, and then you have sins against like, you know, unclean body, right? And he's talking about drug use later on in the chapter, substance abuse, I'd say. Covetousness, you know, like being materialistic, and desiring you know, wealth above all things, and, and he talks about that being idolatry. Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Right? So it's not that we should dabble in these a little bit. He's saying, hey, this should not be once named among you as becometh saints. Right? And, and he's saying, like, a church should not have a reputation for these things. And this is why, you know, we need to think about how we live as Christians and what reputation you know, the church has. Because it's not just about the reputation of the church. Ultimately, you know, the church is trying to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So how, how is our life reflecting to the world what people think of Jesus Christ? That's, that's why it's important. right? It's not just important for our own sake, but it's important for Christ's sake. You know, let it not be once named among you, as become its saints, you know, as children of God, as children of the Most High, we need to walk as children and be good represent, representatives of the family, just like you want your own children to represent your own family well. So there's fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, and then there's the speech. Neither filthiness. So I think this filth, this, these three here is particularly referring to speech, right? Because you already have the uncleanness and the fornication up here. And I think this is talking about different types of speech, filthy speech foolish speech, you know, joking around too much, right? Which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks, you know? The Christian life should be characterised by soberness and gravity, not just jesting, foolish talking, and neither filthiness, right? So you compare this to Colossians 3.8. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Now, these things, does not this describe the successful of the world these days? Does not this describe, you know, when you look at online influencers? You know, because Andrew Tate just recently got, like, cancelled off social media, he's, like, all over social media now, everyone's interviewing, everything like that. And him, along with, like, Jordan Peterson, Jordan and Peterson's not so bad, but Andrew Tate I, I particularly don't like, you know, as an example to young men. You know, but does, 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 does this not perfectly describe that sort of, you know, online influencer these days? You know, what do people get carried away with when they get famous? Sex, drugs, and money. 
and then they start a podcast, right? And they just talk rubbish on that podcast. Think about like Paul and Jake Logan, right? They just talk rubbish and talk all sorts of filthiness, foolish, je jesting. Is that not a picture of, you know, what people, you know, follow and what the young generations are all looking up to these days? And you don't want that to be you, you know, because Christians nowadays just start to see the trends going towards like these online influences. They talk like these online influences. They joke around like these online influencers. Everyone wants to be like Joe Rogan and Logan Paul and Andrew Tate and these sorts of things. And you're seeing that this should not be named among us as become a saint. This is not how Christians are meant to look and how to talk and how to joke and, and all these things. So we need to try and take a stand and be different from the world. Right? And not be uh, like these people. Ephesians 5.5, 5, look, for this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person. So you see how it's the same categories, right? Fornication, unclean person, covetous. No whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater. So why is covetousness idolatry? Because you're putting something above God. And, you know, a lot of people that live in prosperous times like we do, you know, they don't, you don't realize you're covetous. You think covetousness is just people that are just greedy and just think about money all the time. But covetousness is, you know, why is it idolatry? Because sometimes people live their life just for the things that they own. You know, like they, they will go hugely into debt to try and own a property, buy, you know, cars and boats and all these sorts of things. And then they end up just like their life is just about trying to service the debt and pay for these things, pay for this lifestyle. And that's what covetousness is. Covetousness is when you are living for material possessions. You know, and that's like your God. That's like the reason why you live. I mean, how many people, you know, in, in this day and age, like just owning a house is like their idol, right? And right now, houses are like so expensive to the point where you need to borrow like hundreds of that. Like, you know, back in the day, you know, when, you know, you can borrow less, you know, it's not so much of, uh, you know, a, a debt. Nowadays, people are borrowing like 95%. They're borrowing over a million dollars and they are putting themselves into this, this rat race of just ha having to work and work and work and service the debt. Just why? Just so they can have a piece of the land and they can call their own. And, you know, this is covetousness. Covetousness is when you know, you're just living for the things of this life. Now you can understand why it's idolatry. Why is it idolatry? Because you're putting things material possessions over the things of God. Let no man deceive you. This is why, this is why like, you know, we, we generally think about these verses, like let no man deceive you with vain words. We think of like false prophets, right? We think of like false prophets that are, you know, you know tell people to put your hand on the screen, send me $10,000, God's going to bless you with $100,000, you know, that sort of thing when we think about these, this chapter. And we think about false prophets who always get caught up into fornication and all that sort of stuff, trying to cheat people out of their money. But when I was reading through this and studying for this sermon, the picture that kept repeatedly coming up in my mind is these online influencers. These online influencers selling you their course and telling you this is the sort of lifestyle you live. And even Andrew Tate's always saying, you want to escape the major? I don't know if you heard Andrew Tate say this. You want to escape the matrix? You just have to be a millionaire. Oh gosh, that's easy, isn't it? Just be a millionaire, just be a billionaire, and then you have the freedom. You know, that's not, that's not even possible for everyone. You know, some people have to live in this life and live a righteous life. Um, so, but people, they listen to these people day in and day out, and they're getting deceived. They start thinking like these people. They think that's what success is, right? Let no man deceive you with vain words. Right, he's saying, this is not, the, the whoremonger, what is he saying here, right? He's not saying work salvation. He's saying, this is not the right way to live. Remember, this way to live is not, does not get you to heaven, right? So it's not a righteous way to live. Obviously, we are saved by grace, but that's the reminder here. That this is not things that you should be striving for. These are not people you should be striving to emulate. Their philosophies and life and what success is, is not things that you should be taking on board. Let no man deceive you with vain words. But because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. 
you know, so, you know, that's what I said, the online, they think success is having all the women, and all the money, the amount of smoke cigars, and all that. This, this is just a perfect picture. And then they get on their podcast, and they talk a bunch of rubbish, and people listen to them, and it influences them, right? Look what Romans 16, 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. And like, you know, this is why, I, I sometimes I read these verses, and in the context of growing up, you know, spiritually, you know, I got saved when I was 19, so I wasn't growing up as a kid, but as I was going in churches, learning about all oh, false doctrine in churches, mark them which teach false doctrine. And you're so sort of insulated in that spiritual bubble of Baptists that you always just associate these verses with, you know, false teachers, which it, it does. I'm not saying it doesn't apply to them. But when we go outside the fundamental Baptist bubble, you know, there are people being influenced by these people of the world that start telling them, hey, these sorts of things, this is what you should seek, this is what a life of fulfillment is. And it's not. Right? So they're also teaching things contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And that's why, you know, God doesn't want fornication in the church, covetousness in the church, because it affects people. So sometimes people come in and they teach covetousness and they, they, they change people's priorities in their life. But they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches... You know, they know how to talk very well, and that's why their clips go viral. Deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come unto all men, I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. That's always a good principle to live by, right? Be wise in the truth and simple concerning evil. Sometimes people have that the other way around. You know, they know, they know all the evil on in the world, you know, they could talk for hours and hours and hours and go down the rabbit hole of all the conspiracies and evil and everything that's going on in the world. But to ask them about the Bible, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they know some few verses in Revelation, I suppose. So you don't want to be that. You want to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So that's how I try and live my life. Like, you know, it's good not to be ignorant, but you don't need to delve in as deep as some people do. You want to, you want to dive in deep? Dive in deep in the Bible. Know the Bible well and you'll be able to judge anything that gets thrown your way. 1 Timothy 6.3, look at this. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Look at this. Supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. See, so there's a world philosophy that's teaching like success and riches and fame and, you know, pleasures. That's, that's when you're living right. And the Bible says here, no, that's not how a wise child of God lives. That's not what we strive for, right? We're striving for righteousness. We're striving for eternity. You know, we're not striving just for the pleasures of this life. But that's what you'll learn. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. See, do you believe that? Godliness with contentment is great gain? Or do you believe great gain is when you have a lot of stuff, a lot of pleasure, a lot of things? That's, that's gain. That's godliness. See, supposing that gain is godliness. But what's God's philosophy? Godliness with contentment, that you're happy with what you have, is great gain. All right, let's, um, let's continue. Ephesians 5.8 For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So again, this theme of, hey, you're children of the Lord. Walk as children of the Lord. There's his sins. Don't be like the world. Don't be tricked into their vain philosophy, their vain words, de deceived by them, thinking that's what you should be striving for. No, you were sometimes darkness. That's why God's angry with the world because of these things. You're now a child of God walk as a child of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now what I gather from these couple of verses is, you know, we are, we are light, right? So there should be a difference between the children of God and the children of the world. 
Right? That's why it's proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Our life and the way we live is showing other people what's acceptable to God. That's the job of a Christian. Right? Proving what is acceptable unto all. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So you see this difference between what we should be shining brightly as versus the darkness of this world. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. See, Christians should be responsible for saying what is wrong, right? And saying we don't live that well. Live that way. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So some people think this might be a contradiction, right? Because they're saying, well, reprove them for what they're doing. But then isn't it shameful to speak of those things? So what you just have to remember is shame is not the same as sinful, right? So something can be shameful, which just means, you know, it's, it, it, it's not something that we should glory in, right? But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily sin to talk about. So it's saying it's shameful to talk about it. Right? Just like, say, talking about things in the bedroom. It's shameful to talk about those things, but that doesn't mean it's a sin to ever talk about them. They need to be done in the right way. So we reprove them rather than filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, like he mentioned earlier on in the chapter. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So you see here, again, there's, in the beginning, is the way we live, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, and then there's what we say filthiness, foolish talking, jesting. So here, we have here in Ephesians chapter 5, we walk as children of light, the way we live and the way we speak is meant to be different and it's meant to shine a light on what is wrong in the world. You see, that's what he's saying here in Ephesians 5, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and also when we reprove the darkness of this world, we are proving what's unacceptable to the Lord. So our life shows what's acceptable to the Lord as well as what's unacceptable and our speech should show what is acceptable to the world as well as what is unacceptable. Right? So that's why when Christians start blurring those lines, we stop being what we are called to be, which is what? Salt and light. Ephesians 5.13, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, it's not just about what you believe. Yes, what you believe is more important, but it's also about how you look to the world. See, if, if how you look to the world didn't matter at all, then what are they seeing, right? Like, what are the good works that they see so that they will glorify your Father which is in heaven? So this is why, you know, Christians should look different to the world. They should act different to the world. They should do different things to the world. They should speak different to the world. And then the world can see, ah, that's how a Christian, that's how a child of God is. That's, I can get a picture, a picture of what God wants his children to be like because I can see this Christian. That's the goal. Right? So, you know, obviously it's harder to do. You know? I'm not saying I've arrived either, but we're talking about what we should be striving for, right? To be that salt and light. So we're a child of God. We need to live as a child of God. Number two is how to live wisely. Let's continue on in Ephesians 5. We live wisely. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So what is this verse talking about here? Living wisely. Don't be ignorant. You know, some people, they are sleeping spiritually. They are busy. They're very busy and awake physically. You can get up early in the morning, you go to work, you do your job well. You know, you're busy. Busy doing things. But spiritually, you're asleep. What does that mean? Because you're ignorant of the things of God. Don't care for the things of God. You're just living your life, living your physical life. So physically you're awake, but spiritually you're asleep. And he's saying here, hey, wake up, right? Arise from the dead so you can be that light to the world. Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly. What does circumspectly mean? It just means like diligently, cautiously, purposefully. You know, you walk, walk, walk walking wisely, walking with like a full view of life. You know, part of walking wise, like circumspect, you think like all around, is you're considering the high level view of life, what life is about. 
See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So this reminds me of James 4. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. So what is he talking about in Ephesians 5? So part of walking wisely in this world is that you're not ignorant, you're not asleep, and that you realize you don't have that much time. You know, sometimes we live life, like we just have all the time in the world, just spending it doing the things of the world. Like we talk, you know, all the covetousness and things like that. But you know, life is so short. You know, you leave off serving God and doing things for God, and before you know it, you, you're too old, your life's over. And the, and the Bible's saying here, redeeming the time. If you want to walk wisely, if you're wise, you'll know that life is short, that life is but a vapor. So therefore, walk wisely. Walk circumspectly. Don't walk as the world. Walk righteously, because the days are evil. Ephesians 5, 17. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So there's that ignorance. Again, don't be ignorant of God's word. We don't have to wonder what God's will is. The Bible tells us what God's will is. Right? So Psalm 143, verse 10. Teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. So David here is not saying, teach me thy will. He knows God's will. It's teach me to do thy will. The hard thing is doing God's will, not knowing God's will, because we just have to read the Bible to know God's will. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So this is why I think it's, this is all linked together in this chapter. It's uncleanness. Sometimes the way people are unclean, it's just substance abuse. Just having too much alcohol, too many drugs, all that sort of stuff. So you, what he's saying here in verse 18 is, hey, you don't want to be controlled by drugs, right? You want to be controlled by the Spirit of God, right? So let's go on here. So Ephesians 5 verse 3, like I said, that's why I think this uncleanness here is specifically referring to what you put into your body, right? Treating how you treat your body. All right, let's go on to verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we talked about this last week, the purpose of praise, Ephesians 5. But you can see how it's linked into the chapter, right? Because it's how you live and it's the things you say. So rather than foolish talking, jesting, filthy communication, it's praising and giving thanks to God, isn't it? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we should be using our mouth for, to edify, right? To praise God rather than to tear down and to talk filthiness and things like that. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is that related to? Covetousness. Right? Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. See? So, if we are thankful for the things we have and are content with the things we have, we can focus on godliness. Right? So, verse 20 is now linking back to covetousness, which are the three sort of sin categories that he's talking about in Ephesians 5. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. And then also the way we talk. So there's four in there. Okay? Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So this is this submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. What does that mean? We want to serve one another. Right? So we live a righteous life as a child of God, we want unity, and we serve one another. And then we get into the last portion of the passage. And now you can see the context in which he addresses marriage. Because what is he talking about? Right? He's talking about living righteously in this world and avoiding fornication. So now he goes on to, hey, here are some tips on how to have a strong marriage. Like he says in 1 Corinthians 7, like, you know, every man have his own wife, you know, to avoid fornication. So you can see it's not just in here, you know, you know out, of, out of place. What you realize when you see the whole chapter, no, there's actually there's a reason why he's addressing marriage at the end here, because marriage is the best way to avoid fornication. 
right? So let's have a look at this passage and see some tips on having a strong marriage. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So he addresses both genders here in the marriage role, right? And firstly, he addresses the wives. That wives should submit themselves unto their own husbands. And when you look at the degree, you say, well, how submissive should I be to my husband as a wife? Well, he gives a picture here. The husband is the head of the wife. Look at this. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. So he says here, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So you ask yourself the question, how subject should a wife be to her husband? Or how subject should a church be to the commands and will of God? You would say, well, completely submissive. Well, that's what it is teaching here. That's why it says, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, that's not popular. That's not easy to do. But nevertheless, if, see, you know, when you, we follow the world's advice for marriage, you know, people always say, what's the statistics for marriage? 75% of marriages end in divorce. And then people say, well, Christian marriages are no different. 75% of Christian marriages end in divorce too. That's because 75% of Christians aren't following God's tips for marriage. You know, like how many Christians in the world actually follow this and think this is a good idea? They just, you know, they think it's outdated and you know, they, pick, they pick and choose parts of the Bible that they like. Now, you shouldn't see this as oppressive. You know, this is, this is the steps to have a good marriage, that there is order in the house. Now, you can follow the world's advice and have 75% of marriages end in divorce, or you can follow God's advice and have a marriage that is successful, right? So that's the advice to the wives. Then, the husbands. So like when we talked about, remember when I preached that sermon? Be ready to hear. I'm going to apply preaching to yourself first. This is one of those chapters where people do the opposite. They always like look at, you know, husbands know this part very well and they don't know this part very well. And wives know this part very well and they don't know this part very well. Let's switch that up. Know your part very well. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, you, can you be an oppressive husband if you're following this you know like people think oh my wife should be subject to me so i'm just gonna boss her around just to hey you, oh, i'm the husband you just do it because i told you to are you following this you love your wife even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it you know sometimes people hear preaching on roles of marriage and they get this idea that husbands are just these like terrible oppressive like dictators well you, you're not seeing the whole picture right like, the wife is submitting to somebody. Yes, that's her responsibility. The husband's responsibility is to be a loving, protector, provider. Love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Think about what Christ does for us in our life. Think about, think about what he does for his people, how he treats his people. You know, that's what a husband should be. Right? That he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You know what this is talking about? Husbands, men, this is saying you take responsibility for your wife's spiritual walk. You see what I'm saying? Like if your wife is like backsliding and not serving God, like you got to take a look in the mirror. Take a look in the mirror of God's word because it's your job. You know, Christ's job is to sanctify and wash the church and then present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But how often, unfortunately, in so many marriages, wives are the spiritual stronghold in that family. They're the one encouraging the husband to do what's right. They're the one that's trying to hold the family together spiritually. It's the husband's job. Just like Jesus Christ helps us spiritually, the husband's job was take spiritual responsibility for his wife, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So you can see the, the, the level of love a husband is meant to have for his wife, that when you see it in the, con the picture, the whole picture, right, of the submissive wife and the loving husband, then it works, right? Obviously, you get one without the other, it's not the full picture. But also, just because one person is not doing it, that doesn't justify you not doing your wrong. So, you know, there's the ideal, right? It's like salvation, you know, you want works, you want salvation, and you want works, right? That's the ideal world. But then that doesn't mean one is required for the other, you know? So, he's addressing fornication by giving exhortation here in this chapter about how to have a strong marriage. Like I said, the world hates the family or structure that God has ordained, but then the world's marriages fail. And I think Christian marriages are ending at the same rate because they don't follow God's advice. So, you know, you may be saved. And being saved is not enough to have a good marriage. You might be saved, but if you don't follow God's word, you may not have a good marriage. Um, so you want to follow God's word so that you have a good marriage. <clears throat> First Peter 3. So this is like a parallel passage and we see something similar. Likewise, ye wives. So we, so we can see here in Ephesians 5, there's like three verses on the women and then there's like more verses on the husband. So that's why maybe in 1 Peter 3, there's more time spent on the wife and only one verse on the husband. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may... They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold and putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. This is, how, this is how much Sarah was in subjection to Abraham, that he called him my Lord. Whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now the husbands, likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So this is like physically... Weaker. But I'd also say, like, emotionally as well. Emotionally, women tend to be a bit more fragile than men are. But you can see there the, the dynamic in a marriage, right? So men are responsible. You know, they're like, they're a provider or a protector. You know, they love, they cherish, they sanctify their wives. Don't forget that one. And, you know, you're responsible for the spiritual state of your family and your wife. And then women, they submit and they serve their husbands. All right, let's go to the last couple of verses here and then we'll end on a few thoughts. Um, Ephesians 5.30 For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. So he's now going into like, you know, this is marriage, some tips on having a good marriage. You don't, you know, you don't get into fornication, have a strong marriage. And now he's going on into this picture of you know, the same way that man comes together with his wife and they become one flesh. We are one members of Jesus Christ's body in the church. Right? So this, this analogy of Jesus Christ and the church being you know, the marriage relationship being a picture of Jesus Christ and the church, um, this is what he's referring to here. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverenced her husband. So what I want you to think about here is, remember the chapter is about how to walk wisely in this world as a child of God. right? So it's being that example, being that light in the world, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, reproving the works of darkness. And then you see marriage not only avoiding fornication, but why is it also related to that? Because it is, marriage is meant to be a picture to the world of Jesus Christ's relationship to the church. Right? So, think about this. Can you say that about your marriage? Right? Because what are people meant to see when they see a godly Christian marriage? 
and it tells them something about Jesus Christ and the church. What, what should they see? What they should see as a, as a loving, sacrificial provider, spiritual leader of the family that has the wife's you know, best intentions at heart, that sort of thing. Are you that sort of husband? And then what should they see the wife as? They should see the wife as a joyful, submissive servant. Right? But do they see that? Or do they see bitterness? You know? Do they see bitterness having to submit? Do they see like, oh, you know, bitterness having to lead and have, you know, or a, 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 a worldly, uh, ungodly man with like, you know, just covetousness, just the things of the, this world on his mind and not the spiritual state of his family. So you see how it's all linked in with how we show ourselves to the world? You know, because people should be able to see. People, what, what we want people to be able to see when they look at our marriage is what it means to be a loving leader. Because the world now, when they think of leaders, they just think of oppressiveness. They think about when oh, people are in charge, people rule, Oh, that's just like oppressiveness. That's just the patriarchy. That's just, I mean, that's what the world is saying. But can the world look at a Christian marriage and go, wow, so that's what it means to have a loving leader that has his followers' best interests at heart and is doing the right thing. And then he looks at the wife and says, ah, oh, so, so, so you can be joyful following God's word you know, serving joyfully with purpose and everything because look at all these Christian women doing what God has said to them and finding joy in that, finding purpose in that, right? Because it's, it, it's the right thing and they they also serving a leader because they're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So can they see how a leader doesn't need to be selfish and oppressive? Can they see that a follower can serve with joy and purpose, all right? So just uh, recapping, one, you're a child of God, so make sure you act like one. Number two, don't live a life of ignorance and ungodliness. So the four sin categories he talked about in this chapter, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthy communication, right? Filthiness, foolish talking, jesting. Don't follow the examples we see in the world, a lot of these online influences these days. And the last one is follow God's plan for marriage. You know, and be that beautiful picture to the world of our relationship you know, with our amazing Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's what you want your marriage to be. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for the lessons you give us. I just love, Lord, how it all relates. And um, thank you for teaching us from your word, Lord. And I pray, you know, none of us have arrived, Lord. I pray that you will help us. Give us the grace to live as we ought, live as a child of God. Help us to be that salt and light to the world. And, and may our relationships and the way we behave, the way we talk, be a clear picture to the world, proving what is acceptable to you. So we thank you, Lord, for salvation. And thank you that no matter if we come short, we still have a home in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.